recording doesn't happen. Yeah, okay, it's happening. Yeah, so, all right. Um, okay, uh, so for the second quantum circuit lecture, it's my great pleasure to introduce Roman Vassour from UMass Amherst. Uh, as you can see from these references, Roman is a real expert on on all things random circuits, and he's done a lot of um, influential early work on the topic of hybrid quantum circuits, which is random circuits interspersed with uh, measurements. So uh, we're very happy that he agreed to speak here today. Um, and yeah, please go ahead, Roman. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Vedika, and to the organizers in general for putting this together and, and inviting me. Um, I hope everyone is in the audience isn't too tired. I know it's already Thursday and you're already sick of all the talks, but um, but yeah, hopefully that will be still instructive. Um, so, you know, my lecture today is going to be really, um, I guess, a natural continuation of what Adam talked about. Um, I'm also going to be talking about entanglement dynamics. There's also going to be random circuits and also mapping onto statistical mechanics models. So I'm going to be relying quite a bit on what uh, Adam just told you about. Okay. And so the main new ingredient uh, that I'm going to add uh, will be uh, measurements. Uh, so that's why I'm going to be talking about hybrid or monitored uh, quantum circuits. Okay. Um, so before I start, let me say, just please do interrupt me. Uh, maybe with my setup, I won't really see the chat. So, okay, you can put questions in the chat, but. Uh, Maybe periodically remind me to check it. Um, I'll be I'll be checking it. Like okay, but yeah, don't 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 wait until the end. Uh, it's okay if I don't go through everything I want to tell you, and definitely interrupt me. So I'm going to be mostly just writing everything in real time. Uh, I have lecture notes, but uh, this way at least I'll hopefully I won't be too fast. Um, but I have a list of references because I won't be able to refer to things properly uh, during the, the lecture. Uh, this is not complete by, in any way, uh, but at least it should give you an idea if you're like interested in this. Um, the thing I wanted to flag was like this review here. This is supposed to be kind of a pedagogical uh, book chapter review, so it should be fairly readable. Um, and yeah, I have a list of references. Of course, I don't expect you to write everything, but hopefully that will be on the website uh, I've, you know, at the end of the week or something. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about monitor circuits. Uh, the two key papers are the first two here. Uh, one of them is by Adam and collaborators. Um, and you know, this, I put some references and there are really, really many others. And this is by no means an extensive list of uh, all the important papers on that topic. Uh, but I try to emphasize in particular papers that had some relation to the statistical mechanics mapping I'm going to be talking about. Okay. All right. So my, my goal will be uh, really will be to tell you about this notion of measurement induced transitions, uh, which is something that uh, is quite an active topic. Uh, it was, I think, extremely active these days, and actually many people both in the audience and among the speakers and organizers have contributed to this. Um, and so my goal will be twofold. I'd like to tell you, give you an introduction to what those measurement induced transitions are, why many of us are excited about them, why we think they're interesting and why you know, people started thinking about those in the first place. Uh, and at the same time, because it's a lecture, I'll try to have some kind of concrete calculations uh, telling you about um, you know, similar to Adam Stock, how you can map some of those things onto classical statistical mechanics models and how you can learn a lot about those systems through those mappings. Okay, so that's my goal. Um, so with this, let me get started. Um, so I'm assuming you can all see my screen all right. And so my the setup will be pretty similar again to Adam Stock. So, the basic idea is that we're going to be thinking of chaotic dynamics. Okay, so by chaotic, I mean non-integrable, where we'll have entanglement growth, uh, like in uh, Adam's lecture. Uh, but we're going to add a, another element, we'll, which will be local projective measurements, which will compete with that uh, chaotic growth, with that entanglement growth. Okay, and I'll, I'll give more motivation for this later, and you'll see why it leads to something interesting. Uh, you can think that this is, you know, going one step 
closer to you know open quantum systems maybe you can think of like having local measurements as of kind of external environment which is measuring the system you'll say it's a bit more subtle than this like in my talk it will be very important to actually know the measurement outcomes so uh, it won't be like the same as having decoherence or something like this uh, but yeah so the setup will be the following so I, I imagine that I'll I'll have a qubit, uh, so you can think of a qubit if you want, uh, on each side. Okay, so by qubit, I mean a D-level system. And so uh, I'm going to be thinking of a 1D, you know, uh, 1D system. Say so I have N of those sites, right? Um, and I want to think of just chaotic dynamics of those systems, and we're going to model this chaotic dynamics. Uh, by a random circuit. Okay, so this is not really a key to the physics I'm going to be telling you about, but it's very convenient both for numerics and for analytics. Okay, uh, so again, all the motivations that Adam gave you in the previous lecture apply here as well. Uh, we're kind of thinking of toy model for quantum dynamics. Okay, um, so again, we have chaotic dynamics uh, and Really, to model this, we're going to think of a random unitary gates or circuits. Uh, and so you see this picture is the same as what you had in Adam Stock. Okay, so same definition. We're thinking if you want, you have discrete time running this way, and we have layers in a brick wall pattern of, of, of the circuit. Okay. Uh, so this is not really necessary, but again, it's going to make things tractable. All right, so the key new ingredient uh, will be those red dots that I put in this circuit. So you see I put like three red dots uh, on some of the legs of the circuit. And what those are, uh, they will correspond to random events. They will occur with probability P, uh, okay? And they will correspond to a local on one side project, the projective measurement. Okay, so what I mean by this, and I'll make this more precise in a minute, is let's imagine you have qubits, you're just gonna take you know, the third spin at that this time step, you're just going to measure it and you're gonna find say, in the Z basis and just find if it's up or down. Okay, and so those are measurements as in quantum mechanical measurements, uh, meaning they're destructive and projective. And so you'll project on the measurement outcome after this. Okay, so that immediately makes your uh, dynamics non-unitary. So just a brief reminder about how measurements work in quantum mechanics, right? So you have your wave function uh, and uh, after the measurement outcome, I'm gonna, and you get a new wave function, I'm gonna denote it by psi m, where m is the measurement outcome, uh, which is a projector onto, I'm gonna call it pi m, which is given by the projection of the wave function onto the subspace uh, onto say m uh, here. Okay, so this guy is a projector onto say up or down if you have qubits. So here I have a two levels uh, and D level system. So I'm just gonna call it M. Okay, so M is the measurement outcome. And so this occurs with a given probability, right? So when you have measurements and so the probability is just uh, the weight of the wave function onto this outcome squared. And uh, you know, in the way that I wrote it, so you can also write it as uh, the expectation value of that projector. Uh, and it also happens to be the norm of the wave function that they find here. So notice I have not normalized the wave function after the measurement. Okay, so you can, obviously if you want to compute something physical after that, you'll need to normalize it. Okay, so in many textbooks or maybe in the way you learn Quantum mechanics, you saw like a normalization. Okay. Does that make sense so far? <clears throat> okay, so, all right. So I'll talk about what those measurements do in a minute and why we actually do this. Uh, but so before I do that, let me really make the main claim. And before I do this, I need to really emphasize why it's important those are measurements uh, and not something else. Um, there's a little bit of background noise, so probably, again, make sure you mute it if you're not 
asking a question. Yeah. Okay, so one thing I should say right away, which will be really important, uh, is this notion of quantum trajectories uh, versus, um, okay, I'm going to use like a technical term here versus thinking in terms of quantum channel. Okay. So when you think about measurement and maybe the way you learn about measurements in textbooks uh, is you kind of have two equi you know, equivalent for some quantities ways of thinking about it. Uh, you can think that you have your wave function and you're gonna make a measurement. Uh, and again, you're projected to a new pure state, you have a new wave function. So that's what I wrote before. And if you have many of those measurements, so you have your circuits uh, with those unitaries and those different measurements, you can imagine you have a general operator that will combine both the unitary and the measurements. And you know you can have many different measurement outcomes and we can call this a quantum trajectory and that's this wave function psi m, which is still a pure state. Okay. Um, equivalently, you can say, okay, maybe you can also ignore the measurement outcomes so that you can trace them out in some way. Um, okay, so, and if you do this, your state you should consider is in a mixed state, so you can describe it by a density, ma density matrix, which is now mixed, uh, which will be just a superposition of all the states psi m. Okay, and so this is normalized with trace one in the way I defined it, and each again of those outcomes will occur with probability pi uh, p m. I should say this quantity is known as Born probability or the Born rule. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so this density matrix where you average over the measurement outcome is um, usually useful. And if you think of most quantities, most physical quantities, you can actually either think in terms of quantum trajectories or in terms of that average density matrix and they give you the same answer. Okay, so let me, let me illustrate this. Uh, let's say you want to compute a quantity that's linear in the, let's say you want to compute um, a quantity that's linear in the density matrix. So let's say you're interested in uh, the expectation value of some observable. Okay, so let's say you want to compute the average of some operator, I'm just calling it O, so it could be like a magnetization or anything you want, right? Um, so let's say you want to average this and you want to average this over like, again, quantum mechanical, you know, you want you're the quantum mechanical average and you also want average of the set of measurement outcomes. Okay, and so I'm gonna denote this by a bar like averaging over the measurement outcomes, okay? So what this is by definition is summing over all the measurement outcomes. So again, maybe the first spin was up, second spin was down, and you want to sum over all those possible histories. Those occur with probability Bm. Uh, and you want to average the expectation value of O in a quantum trajectory M. And so what this is, is a sum over, again, uh, those trajectories or over the measurement outcomes, if you want. Okay, and what this o of M here is, is uh, Psi M O Psi M. And since my wave function is not normalized, uh, I'm just gonna divide by the norm of Psi M. Yes, so importantly in my Psi M is not normalized. Uh, thank you, Grace, for clarifying this. Uh, so in the way I defined it, my psi m is not normalized. Okay. You can normalize it as well, but it will actually be more convenient for me not to do it. So obviously when you compute something physical, like this expectation value, you should normalize it. Okay, so that's why I have the denominator here. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so hopefully this makes sense, right? So you're summing of all possible trajectories of measurement outcomes. You put the probability that this measurement outcome will uh, occur and you have this expectation value in that given trajectory, which corresponded to fixed measurement outcomes. Okay. So the key thing to notice here is that this PM is the norm of psi M, which is not normalized, right? Uh, so this factor actually cancels out this factor. Okay. 
So this expectation value you can rewrite as trace of row O, where rho is this row average. I don't know, maybe I should give it a bar. Uh, okay, which is average over the measurement outcomes. Okay. So, um, you know, this, this shows you that you can either think of some of those quantum trajectories or you can think in terms of that average density matrix. Okay. And if you wrote like an evolution equation for rho bar, it would be something called a quantum channel in the context of the circuit. The details don't really matter, but like if you had a continuous time, that would be like a Limblad equation. So if you're familiar with open quantum systems, that's this type of formalism we're talking about. Okay. So it, for a quantity of this type, you can see again, you can kind of use both formalisms uh, and, and you'll get the same answer. So now imagine you want to compute some nonlinear quantity. I'm sorry, just to clarify yeah. real quick. The, so yes. trace of row is one. Yes. Okay. So the base of row bar is one in the way I defined it. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thanks. Right. You can see it like, yeah, you, you'll get sum of PM, which is one. Uh, maybe something I should write here. So sum of PM over M is one. Right. So if you sum the probabilities of all the measurement outcomes, you should get one. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that happens. That's also trace of row bar. So what about a nonlinear quantity? So let's say you want to compute some, I'm going to write it this way, like a square of some observable, but average of a measurement outcomes. Okay, so what this is more precisely is again, the sum over the measurement outcomes, they occur with probability PM. And now you want the expectation value of O, M but squared. So if you write this explicitly, uh, it will not be PM, Psi M O Psi M divided by Psi M Psi M and I have squared here. Okay. So you, you, you know you can simplify this PM with one of the powers in the denominator, but importantly, this a quantity like that uh, cannot be expressed simply in terms of row bar. Okay. All right, so why am I making a big deal out of this? Uh, so it, it, I'm making a big deal because it will really play a crucial role in what I'm going to tell you. So the main claim uh, I'm going to make is there are interesting, there's interesting structure of inverse phase transitions in the quantum trajectories that would be invisible in row bar. Okay. Uh, so there are transitions and there's really lots of interesting physics in those, quant in those quantum trajectories that people have uncovered in the past couple of years. Okay, and, but all of that physics is uh, not in uh, the average density matrix. So it's really crucial that you have measurements and you have knowledge of the measurement outcomes and that you can evaluate a quantity like this. Okay. So if you think about it, uh, you know, think about this quantity. So, so like, because of what I told you, it also tells you that any observable we're gonna be looking at will not be something that's just linear in the density matrix like here. It will be something kind of, uh, you know, with squares on something like an entanglement entropy that will be nonlinear. Okay, uh, that immediately should tell you this, you know, those quantities are maybe a little bit exotic if you wanted to measure them and I'll come back to this because um, it requires preparing the system. You know, if you want to evaluate an expectation value like this one, right? It requires preparing the state psi m over and over again if you want to evaluate this expectation value. Okay, so it requires being able to prepare a state with given measurement outcomes, uh, which means you would have to you know, it's known as a post-selection issue. Uh, you have a huge overhead in actually doing this in practice. And I'll come back to this. Um, you know, this is this makes this transition challenging to observe than in, in, in like you know, typical systems, uh, but it has very deep physical implications. And that phase structure 
has many consequences. I hope I'll convince you are interesting. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, just one question. When you said there is a huge overhead, does that mean there's like an exponentially large overhead or polynomially? Yeah. It's exponential. exponential. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't mean that I should say that there is an experiment on this and I'll, I'll come to this. And there are like okay. people, including Vedika, for example, have worked on ways to like fight this exponential overhead. Uh, but in principle, on phase value, and you know, in the way they find it here, there is an exponential overhead to compute those quantities. Okay. Okay. Uh, so at this point, you could decide, oh, okay, maybe that's not something you want to hear about because it sounds very hard to realize. But again, bear with me, and hopefully, I'll convince you there are a lot of interesting things that happen, uh, you know, despite this exponential overhead. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. So. All right, so there are many interesting things and many observables you could define. And so I'm gonna focus on uh, maybe the simplest one, which is the, the first one that people have studied, uh, which is what's known as an entanglement transition uh, in Psi M, okay. And the basic idea is maybe like intuitive, go back to the circuit. So you saw in Adam's talk that if you just have a unitary circuit, the entanglement entropy of the subsystem will just grow linearly. Right, so you'll just become highly entangled. So now, like again, think of a given quantum trajectory where you put those measurements. If you have enough of those measurements, you will effectively disentangle your system. Okay, so a simple way to see this is say if you take probability p equals one, p equals one means that at every time step you measure every single spin in your system. Okay, so you measure the first spin, maybe you find it's up, you measure your second spin, you find it's down, and so on and so forth. Once you do this, your system is in a pure is in, in a pure state, and it's a, just a product state, right? It's a classical state where the first spin is up, the second spin is down, and so on. So this would have zero entanglement. So you can naturally see there's a competition in terms of entanglement dynamics between those measurements that will tend to disentangle your your wave function psi m, and um, and the quantum chaotic dynamics that will tend to increase entanglement. Okay. And so the claim, uh, so the ma main claim I'm gonna make and try to illustrate is as a function of P, okay? So P is this probability of measurements between zero, zero and one. There's a critical uh, rate of probability of, uh, pro uh, probability of measurements, PC. Uh, and you know, precise value doesn't really matter. It depends on the type of gates that you take and things like this. Where if you look at entanglements and I'm gonna kind of sketch I'll, I'll remind you of the type of entanglements we're looking at in a minute, but just schematically, you know, you can think of the second Renyi entropy that Adam was telling you about. And this regime entanglement will grow linearly with time and eventually will saturate uh, to some value which scales with system size, with the size of your subsystem. Okay, so this corresponds in Anushia, with the very first lecture by Anushian thermalization. This is the analog of thermalization here. Even though there's no cost of quantity, your you know subsystems are becoming maximally mixed, um, and here if you're above that critical threshold, uh, the claim is that entanglement will only will grow a bit, but then it will saturate to something that is only order one or is a constant. Okay, and so here I'm thinking of uh, I'm going to be thinking of, I have my 1D system and I'm going to consider an interval of size LA. Uh, I'm going to call it A. And the Roman, there's, a, there's a question clarifying the difference between Born probability and measurement rate probability. No, 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 those like, are different. So the measurement rates, uh, what I call measurement rate is P and that is just something, that is a parameter in the model. And so that's something we're going to tune and it tells us how many, it tells you the density of those red dots. So that's the density of the measurements that we're going to make. So if P is zero, we make zero measurements. If P is one, uh, we'll have red dots everywhere and we measure every single site. And if P is intermediate, so again, it's the density of those, uh, of those measurements. The bone probability is the probability that a given configuration of measurement outcomes will occur. Okay, so that's what you learn when you learn about measurements in quantum mechanics. So I hope that answers this. So P larger than PC related to Zeno effect. Yeah, so you can think of it as a many body Zeno effect and that's a very good intuition to have, yes. 
uh, perhaps it, it's a generalization if you want, but it, you know it's been called many body zeno effect. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you're measuring and of the system. Very good. Okay. So the claim is like if you look at entanglements of those quantum trajectories. Uh, there is this phase transition in entanglement, and you know, as physicists, we all like phase transitions, or at least I do. Uh, and so, phase transitions are interesting. They tell you that there's something dramatic that happens, and this phase transition is fundamentally new, right? It's not just a quantum phase transition at zero temperature. You don't have like a simple order parameter to it, at least in the same way as quantum phase transition or thermal phase transitions. Um, and you can think of it as something that tells you about the complexity of uh, you know, simulating, for example, such circuits where you have those measurements. Right? So let me define entanglement uh, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, so I'm here entanglement A, okay? So it's in region A uh, and I'm gonna also put a label N which is the Rényi index. So I'm gonna be thinking of Rényi entropies. So in Adam's talk, you were thinking of the second Rényi entropy. For my purposes, all Rényis are equally hard to compute. So I'll just write a general expression. Okay. So what is the Rényi entropy? Well, it's just a uh, log of trace uh, of row A to the N. So I have many indices. So I should let me define everything I'm writing here. So my I'm writing a density matrix, but here it's just a pure state. So I'm, row M is just uh, psi M psi M. Okay, um, so it's not the same as row bar. It's density matrix in a given measurement outcome. Row A, as it, as in Adam's talk, is just the reduced density matrix in interval A. So that's the trace over A bar of row M. So you trace over all degrees of freedom outside of A. Okay. And so the Rényi, density, the Rényi entropy is just the log of the trace of that quantity. You should remember that my wave function was not normalized. So in order to get something meaningful, I have to normalize it. Um, so I'm gonna define it. I'm gonna divide by trace of row M here. So I have lots of indices. M refer to measurement outcomes. N is the Rényi index. Uh, you can take it to be two if uh, if you prefer, and if you find those indices too confusing. Um, but again, like in Adam's case, taking the second Rényi entropy did lead to some simplifications. In my case, it won't really. So, um, so this is the Rényi index. So that would be the Rényi entropy in the quantum trajectory. And what we're going to do is just average this, uh, and we'll average this over all measurement outcomes. And again, this occurs with probability PM. And we can also average this over all possible circuits. OK, uh, so this is, say, for practical purposes. If you want to do this in numerics, uh, you'll average over circuits. So what I mean by average over circuits is averaging over those gates, which I didn't, you know, again, like those gates are random, like in Adam Stock. Uh, they could be hard random. You can take different subsets of gates. Uh, people do a lot of Clifford gates for numerics. Again, the details don't matter too much. Um, okay, so you're averaging over those random gates and averaging also over where you put the measurements. Okay, does that make sense? Um, maybe I should write this explicitly so that we're really clear on what this means. So this is an average over the random gates and also over the measurement locations. Okay. With, the, with those factors of P, like the probability. Can I ask questions? Yes, please do. Yeah. Uh, so in the argument of logarithm, in the denominator, should it be uh, Trace of row M or trace of row AM? Um, yeah, th those are the same. Uh, but yes, like the, the, it's trace of row. It's just the total normalization of the wave function. But you see, I if mean, you trace in, row in A. The denominator, because yeah. now you introduce uh, something which, is, which has a partial trace. Yeah, so in the numerator, you have the partial trace. In the denominator, you trace over everything. 
right? So if you trace uh, yeah, I, I think if you trace off everything, is it just the same thing as PM? Correct. It is. It is the same as PM. So, that, that's absolutely correct. Yes. So, so you can also write it as PM to to power M. Absolutely. Very good. That will actually be very useful for later. So as you notice, uh, trace of row M is the same as PM. That is okay. correct. Yes. That is so you you could rewrite that factor as trace of row n here, and I will actually use this later. Okay, and in the numerator, uh, you first take power, uh, like row a m to power n, and then you take then trace. You trace. Correct. Okay. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. this is uh, so. Remember in 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 Adam's talk, you saw the version where you had trace of row a squared. Right, so yes, yes. Your, yeah, the, the difference here is I'm replacing the square by a, you know, number n, integer n. Okay. Um, yeah. Any other questions? So that that's really the setup and the main claim. So you know, it's it really makes more sense for me to spend time on this and. Uh, okay. So obviously you should realize this entropy that I wrote is highly nonlinear in like the density matrix. So it's a quantity that, you know, you cannot express in terms of row bar, okay? Uh, and so it's a pretty dramatic claim. Maybe it doesn't surprise you that much. I don't know, that depends on like, by adding just the measurements, you're able to drive a transition in the entanglement structure of those wave functions, okay? Uh, and it's also a model that doesn't have a lot of structure, right? You just have this random unitary circuits plus the measurements, and that alone is enough uh, to give you an actual phase transition. Okay. Uh, and in those quantum trajectories. And so that's what's known as uh, um, a measurement induced phase transition. Okay. Uh, so ignore the figure at the bottom for the moment. Um, okay. So, I should mention here at this point, and this is kind of a, a nice way to tell you why are so many people excited about this. Um, okay. So there are many ways of thinking about this phase transition and this connects to many interesting things I won't be able to talk about. Uh, okay, so I have limited time, so I'll be focusing on one specific aspect, which is how to think of this phase transition uh, and its relation to statistical mechanics. Uh, but this phase transition, it turns out there are like many different ways people came up with to think about it. And they all give you a slightly different perspective or maybe a different reason to care about it, right? So you can care, you can think of this transition as in terms of the complexity of like simulating uh, those circuits. Um, you can, I should, I should say right away that uh, people came up with a different uh, you know, interpretations. Let me put it this way. Yeah. And also different observables. So if you don't like entanglement entropy, uh, it turns out like entanglement entropy is, you know, it's, it's an important quantity in that transition, but there are other transition, other observables you can look at that also show transition. Um, and you can think of it as, a, so let me, I'm just going to mention words and I'm not going to say a lot, but just those are kind of keywords that. Uh, you, you'll see if you read papers on this topic. Uh, so there's a notion, there's the way in which you can think of this transition as a so-called purification transition, where if you think of your initial state as instead of being a pure state is already mixed, uh, there's, uh, you can think of this phase where like P is small as an entangling phase where your state remains mixed, but if P is large enough, you can purify your state. Um, there are relations to, there are, uh, you know, this a closely related uh, statement is that of NCDA probes, where <clears throat> if you, you, instead of looking at entanglement, you can imagine that maybe you're going to couple one of your spin in your system to a qubit or qubit that will be some NCDA probe, and you maybe entangle it in a bell pair, and you can ask about. Uh, well, the, say the entanglement or mutual information of this qubit with the rest of the system as a function of time. And that's basically asking whether you can kind of store the quantum information of that qubit in the circuits and whether it's destroyed or collapsed by the measurements. 
Okay. Uh, and so this gives you a very different, uh, you know, interpretation of this transition that's related to uh, quantum error correcting quantum error corrections. Uh, and again, I won't talk too much about this, um, but it's basically this transition ends up corresponding to the ability of your circuits to kind of hide or scramble informations from the local measurements. So you can ask about, can you encode some information and in principle decode it okay, in your circuits? And so the unitary dynamics will tend to kind of scramble information into highly non-local degrees of freedom that are very hard for the measurements to access. And ultimately that's why this phase transition exists. Okay, so the measurements are not able to immediately collapse your wave function. You actually need a finite rates of those measurements, a given rate of measurement PC until you can really, you know, if until the measure, until the dynamics is not able to hide efficiently all the information uh, from the measurements. Okay, um, so I'm just saying words here. I could probably spend an hour explaining this in more details. Um, Okay, but those are really important concepts. So there's a huge, there are important connections to fields of quantum information sciences and quantum error correcting codes. You can think of this as a decoding problem. Um, okay, so if you're interested in this, you can read the reviews or you can go and see like the, the papers in particular David Hughes and Michael Gullens and Ehud Altman and collaborators worked a lot on this. Um, and so there's also a sense in which this transition is about like how much information can you extract, you know, as an observer from the circuits. Okay, so if you have an initial stage, you can ask if you make those measurements, like how efficiently are you learning about the state from those measurements? And it turns out that this transition is yet is, you know, this is also a way you can think of this transition. So you can see this is relatively rich. Um, okay, and so there's a lot of things going on here. I should mention there's an experiment on this from the Monroe group. Uh, I won't talk too much about this. Uh, despite the uh, post-selection problem I mentioned, you can uh, realize this and the key is to think of it as a decoding problem and uh, with Clifford Gates. So it's still a relatively small scale system, uh, but in principle, uh, it could be scaled. And I should say in the recent year, people realize that this is a lot even richer than uh, this entanglement transition I'm telling you about. Uh, if you start, start adding different type of competing measurements or symmetries, in particular Vedika and others have worked on this, you can get a lot you know, new phases and new phase transitions from those competing measurements. Uh, and so there's a whole, it's not only two phases, there's a whole zoo of uh, phase diagram of phases. So you can get topological phases, you can get symmetry breaking uh, order, you can get SPTs and so on uh, in, in those, uh, okay, from different type of measurements that maybe involve more than one spin and maybe adding symmetries to those circuits. Okay, so again, I won't talk too much about this, but you should know there's been a lot of, uh, I, I would say in the past year, there's been a lot of results uh, in, in this direction. Okay, um, and so there are, Lots of different type of orders and phase transitions, uh, which is also why people got excited about this. You know, you go. This is kind of the whole point of equilibrium physics, uh, non-equilibrium physics, that you can realize new type of phases, maybe going beyond the limitations of, say, being in thermal equilibrium. Uh, and so measurements allow you to do this. Okay. All right. So I realize I just said a bunch of words without getting into details. It's just because the rest of the talk will be more concrete and more narrow, but I just wanted to make sure I, I, I could also mention some of those interesting directions too. Is there any specific question? Yes. Hmm. By introducing measurements, all the scrambling can be avoided, but won't it introduce decoherence, which also relates to informal loss in the environment? Um, so, Okay, there is, okay, so, so you have to be a bit, so I'm not talking about decoherence here in the way I'm not considering the environment explicitly. I'm really, again, I'm, I'm learning about the measurement outcomes. There's a question of what happens to this transition once you introduce actual decoherence, where if you say have really 
information loss somewhere and it turns out that it, it you know it will kind of spoil the physics i'm talking about so here let's be careful i'm really talking again i'm i'm assuming you have perfect knowledge of all the measurement outcomes so that's not really the same as you know decoherence and i i know the measurement outcomes and i'm preparing my system knowing all those measurement outcomes okay so it's not really the same as uh decoherence in the way i defined it I'm not sure if that fully answered that question, but hopefully. Any other question? Just a added question to this thing. Even if I know the measurement outcomes, the unitaries may not be perfect. I mean, I could have the unitary gates, which can be open to decoherence or maybe something else. Yeah. In that In case, system, would this yes. thing fall yeah. apart or would it survive or? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, well, so so here my unitaries are random, but yes, if you introduce like again some kind of open channel or decoherence channel, uh, it, it would spoil that that transition I'm going to talk about. Uh, but you know, some signatures will still remain though, right? So, um, but yes, it is important that you don't have decoherence at all, uh, at least for like you know, in theory. And it's 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 important that I, I I just have an actual pure state and I don't have actual um, decoherence here. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe like once I talk about the statmic model, I'll be able to say why that is. Uh, so the statmic model will have some symmetry, and that symmetry will be broken if if we have decoherence. Okay. Do you mind elaborating the protocol related to general cross measurements? Okay. Do they put the bond priority the measurement? Okay. How does emission and non-emission dynamics possibly emerge from this circuit? Very good. Um, yes, so I'm not talking about cross operators just on purpose to avoid being too technical. Uh, in, in general, that operator pi m, once you have those different measurements and the different unitary gates, that would be a cross operator. Um, again, I'm just on purpose kind of avoiding talking about this. Uh, Everything I've defined on this slide is in principle enough to kind of have everything with the protocol. Um, so again, I'm not normalizing my psi m. That's really the only important thing that will come in. Uh, the measurement rate, I will come back to it later on. How does the emission and non-emission dynamics possibly emerge from these circuits? So um, I mean, you'll you'll see there's an effective with that mapping onto effective statmic model. There is some kind of you can write some effective Hamiltonian in some way that will describe this entanglement dynamics. So I'll get to this. Uh, one thing I should say is again, like you know, you could be tempted to think in terms of row bar, and that's maybe what you mean by non-emission dynamics when you think of the open system. Uh, that row bar doesn't have an entanglement transition. Well, that row bar is always volume low entangled. Uh, so it's important that you're not just thinking of the time evolution of row bar or row average. Um, okay. But there will be a sense in which you have an emergent effective Hamiltonian describing uh, the dynamics here. Okay, I'll, I'll wait to see if there's any other question. Like I said, it's a good stopping point because the rest of the lecture will be about sketching, mapping onto a statmec model. So if you guys have questions about the setup uh, or about the transition in itself, I think that would be a really good point to ask those. Okay, I'll just write my next thing in the meantime, just to see if something comes up. Okay. So in the rest of this lecture, okay, and so I'm good, since I have limited time, I have to choose a specific topic. I'll, I'll just focus on the transition itself, right? Uh, and one aspect which is interesting is, uh, you know, like, Stats, whether you do quantum matter physics or statistical physics, usually we like phase transitions, right? They can have interesting things like critical exponents, universality classes, uh, and there's all there's a bunch of questions that you can uh, that you can ask here. Uh, what kind of criticality do you have? Uh, do you have critical exponents? Uh, do you have universality classes? Um, 
And more generally, you could ask, okay, it's maybe related to whether you can have some effective Hamiltonian or something. Can we write like a field theory for this? Uh, you know, can we do all the things we like to do with more traditional phase transitions? Okay. Um, and so this is something that many of us have tried to do over the past years. Uh, and so let me summarize what we know before I get into any type of detail. And then I'll kind of sketch how we uh, have some partial answers to some of those questions. Okay. So what we do know how to do is uh, map calculations such as entanglement and other quantities onto statistical mechanics models. Okay. Um, and if you followed uh, everything that Adam said, uh, it's maybe not too surprising. It's really the same logic. Uh, we can do similar calculations for those uh, monitored circuits and we can get those exact mappings onto uh, 2D stat make models. Okay, and so you'll be, you'll see there's a caveat. It requires some, what's known as a replica trick and, and I'll sketch this later. This mapping gives you a very nice qualitative picture. And uh, th that's really the thing I'd like to emphasize above any type of technical detail. Because um, the qualitative picture is really the only thing that matters here. Uh, and, that's, and that's this picture of entanglement domain wall or entanglement, uh, I guess Adam was calling it entanglement membrane. Um, so it's this idea that you, entanglement behaves as the free energy of a domain wall uh, in, 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 in those circuits. So that was already true in his talk uh, and it remains true here. And so the, the picture is the following. The main claim is that the entanglement entropy and that will be true for all Rennies. Uh, it's maybe one thing I should say, like all Rennie entropies have the same PC. They, they all have a transition, at least for N larger than one, they all have the same, transi the same transition. So the main claim, which again goes beyond those monitored circuits, and is really the reason I'm telling you about this is it's, it's become a standard tool that many people use in many, many different fields in quantum information and related to those random circuits, is that entanglement behaves as the free energy cost of a domain wall. Okay. So that's something I hope I'll be able to sketch uh, later, but again, if you, you know, like in the end of Adam's talk, that's precisely what he established. Okay. So what do I mean by this? So uh, the claim is that we'll start with our circuits and we'll be able to get a statistical mechanics model in space time. So, uh, you know, this will be time, this will be original space, uh, but then we'll get, instead of our circuits, we'll have a classical stat -mech model where you can compute entanglement in terms of partition functions. Um, okay, and entanglement more precisely. So that stat -mech model you can think will be some sort of effectivizing model. Uh, again, Adam had those plus and minus degrees of freedom, which were like Ising spins. And um, <clears throat> and if you want to compute, so if you run your circuit until time t, okay, and you stop here and say now you want entanglement of a region A, so. Uh, in that picture, you see interval A is here. Uh, the claim is that this is like having a different boundary condition. Uh, so you fix the spins to be up in A bar, okay, or minus in A. Okay, so again, uh, I'm really following Adam's talk here. I I'll derive this again. Uh, hopefully I'll have enough time to actually sketch the derivation um, in a few minutes but it's precisely the same picture that Adam was uh, you know, advocating for in the earlier lecture, okay? So <clears throat> in Adam's talk, I think A was like half of the system. So you had like this kind of domain wall. Uh, here, there's, um, you know, how do we define the domain wall? Yes, so the domain wall in the Isaac model. Um, so uh, the domain wall is this, so it's kind of drawn here in red. Okay, so what do I mean by domain wall? I'm, we're forcing, so imagine an Ising model and imagine it is in a ferromagnetic magnetic phase. So imagine it's a ferromagnet. magnet, okay? So spins want to be aligned. And now like in region A bar, you force all the spins say to be up, okay? But in region A, you force the spins to be down, okay? 
So it gives you a picture like this one. And maybe I can zoom in a bit. Okay. Uh, where you see because like spins want to be aligned, you're forcing a domain wall uh, that separates those domains of spin up and of spin down. Okay. Uh, so spins want to be aligned. And so there's a line tension. And so this costs some energy and some free energy. Okay. And in that regime, if you have a fail magnet, so imagine your statmec model, so your Ising model is a is in a fail magnetic phase or ordered phase. Well, you can take an Ising model and you can precisely define the, the cost a of that energy. Sorry. Uh, yes. On how to define the domain wall. What's that? There's, there's a question on how to define the domain wall. Oh, sorry, that's what I was trying to explain. Maybe I didn't do a good job of it. So, so the, the domain wall is defined as follows you. This delta F is precisely defined as you know, the free energy of a configuration where you fix the spins to be up and then minus in region A. Okay. Minus a free energy where all spins are up. Okay. So you take your Ising model, you can compute its free energy where all spins are up. And now in region A, you compute a new free energy, but you force all spins to be down in that region A. Okay. And I defined this free energy as free energy, this difference of free energy I defined as free energy cost of the domain wall. That makes sense. So why does it measure again a domain wall? Think of it as a ferro magnet. Again, the domain wall is this thing that I drew in red or, or pink here. Okay. Does that make sense? So it effectively, like because you have this change in boundary condition for plus to minus, you have this domain. Yes. Yeah. So again, Adam also had this, right? This kind of directed polymer, uh, you know, there, there are different words for it. Uh, it is this domain wall um, uh, that, you know, if, if you ordered, you see this domain wall. So let me erase that. Uh, if you have a fail magnet, you can take an Ising model. So it's a, you know, now it's a calculation that's a lot easier than computing entanglements, right? So we started from like computing entanglements in a non-equilibrium system with measurements. Sounds horribly complicated. Now I'm saying this maps on to take an Ising model and ask how much free energy does it cost to kind of change a boundary condition somewhere. Okay. Uh, so that's a lot easier, you know, it's a lot easier. That's a classical question. Um, and so if you have a fail magnet, you have a line tension of that domain also. It costs some energy, you know, uh, to create that domain here. And so that free energy is extensive and it scales in the size of the domain you're trying to create. Okay. Uh, however, like if you have a power magnet, and so it turns out that this phase transition ends up being a phase transition in that effectivizing model. So here you have a ferro magnet, and here you have a power magnet. Okay. So imagine now your Ising model becomes disordered. Well, the same free energy, okay, the same free energy now uh, actually doesn't scale with the size of the interval, okay. So if you have a disordered Ising model, you can compute that free energy difference. Uh, and intuitively it's because a power magnet is a domain wall condensate. So you have domain walls everywhere already, right? So you can kind of see in that picture here, in that Kelton picture, uh, you have domain walls all over the place. So even if you create a domain wall here, you can kind of go into the bulk and one coalition length into the bulk and that's it. Uh, and you don't have to pay more energy than that. And so the, <clears throat> Changing and forcing the boundary condition in a power magnet actually, you know, it doesn't scale with the size of the interval to do this. So it gives you, okay, I haven't established this mapping, right? Uh, but again, before we do this, like it's just morally, it's exactly the same type of derivation as what Adam sketched. Uh, it gives you this picture of a domain wall gives you, or free energy of a domain wall gives you a classical picture, if you want, of the phase transition in terms of a transition in that statmec model. You'll have an effective Ising model, and as, as in Adam's talk, in Adam's talk, that Ising model was in a ferromagnetic ferromagnetic phase. It was nice and ordered, uh, and the measurement rates p or the measurement probability p, as we tune it effectively, we're going to make our Ising model disordered. It's going to end up in a power magnetic phase, and uh, because of this, you know, it will drive that phase transition from a ferromagnetic phase to an Ising to a disordered phase will correspond to that entanglement transition uh, where entanglement is volume low in this regime here. 
uh, or are yellow in that regime there. Um, so that will be really the main, the main result. So if I don't get to the end in all the technical details, and if you have to uh, get, you know, anything out of my talk and probably out of Adam's talk, is this picture that you should think of entanglement in terms of, uh, again, either like a membrane or domain wall uh, or, or polymer. Uh, and, and that's like, the, this has an entropy, this has an energy, and this gives you a very useful picture to think about entanglement dynamics in those systems. Uh, does the picture make sense? Just so like, I, I will now go ahead and try to derive this, but uh, let me ju just make sure that uh, those diagrams with Ising spins, they make sense. Uh, just one question. Yeah. So before when you introduced how the entanglement scales uh, with time, you had a linear rise and then a saturation to right. something order L. And yeah. on the other side, you had an order one saturation. Very this good. mapping yeah. is a comment about the saturation values or also about the um, rise? Yeah. Uh, thanks, it's a very good question. So, so this mapping can actually do both. So in the picture that I drew here, I'm thinking about the saturation where the circuit is very big. Um, so if, if your circuit was kind of shallow, so imagine like time, Okay, let me imagine like the circuits maybe stopped there, right? Maybe maybe that was t equals zero. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. then, then actually like your, in your Ising model, a way to kind of minimize the energy would be to do something like that, right? Um, and to kind of just maybe just go to the boundary. So my point is like, it, yes, this, uh, this mapping thinking in terms of domain wall will also take into account the fact that the, you know, it will also give you this linear growth. So in Adam's talk, if you remember, he had a configuration where he was drawing something like that. We had plus and yeah. minus as a function of yeah. time. Yeah, so, so this works here as well. Like eventually if you have a finite interval A and you go to long enough time, that domain wall will become spatial if you want, instead of going in time. And so that will give you the saturation. Okay. So initially okay. as a function of time, the domain wall will kind of propagate in time and eventually to kind of minimize its free energy uh, will kind of become spatial. Okay, and the guarantee that you have that this domain wall will be just one connected piece in the way that you've drawn is also because of this energetics? I mean, it won't be two yeah. domain walls. So, so this is more of a picture, like, like the real mapping okay. will be this free energy difference with different boundary conditions. Okay, uh, fine. If the model is nice and ordered, you can just draw this picture. But on top of it, you'll have fluctuations. In principle, you'll see that domain wall is actually a bit more complicated. It can actually branch, and the model is not really an Ising model. It actually has more species. So, so it's okay. an actual concrete picture is a bit more complicated than that. Um, okay. You know, and on the power magnetic side, you cannot really draw what. So, so that domain wall will fluctuate. It's kind of a, yeah, a cartoon picture <laughs> I'm putting on those free energy differences. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Cool. All right. So it's good. If, uh, one thing that I should say uh, before I just move on to the static model. So at the transition, uh, it turns out that uh, there's a dynamical exponent one. Okay. So dynamical. Ex Many people talked about dynamical exponents earlier in the context of hydrodynamics and so on. Uh, so here, what I mean, like, is in the sense of, uh, you know, quantum phase transitions, if you want. So add this phase transition, uh, if you want, there's some emergent relativistic invariance. So space and time will scale in the same way. Okay. Um, and that should be very surprising. Uh, if you think of the system, okay, you have space, you have time with those measurements, it's not obvious at all that you should have a dynamical exponent one, but it ends up being true and coming out of this that make mapping. Okay. Uh, one thing I'm also going to mention, but I, I won't really say a lot more about this because I want to talk about the stat make mapping more. Uh, there's even more than z equals one, there's also what's known as conformal invariance uh, at the transition. Okay, um, so conformal invariance is kind of a very, so it's, if you don't know what it is, it's a very, it's a kind of a local scale invariance. Uh, 
uh, and it's the type of invariance you would have, say, at a phase transition in an Ising model. Uh, so again, if you think of this mapping onto a static model, maybe that makes sense. Uh, but it, something very non-trivial for entanglement, and it has uh, consequences for, say, quantities like mutual information and for, for many physical quantities in those circuits. Uh, yeah, I, I won't talk about this today too much, but it follows from this TATMEC mapping. Okay. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say, and hopefully uh, I'll, you know, I, ha I have at least something in my notes about this, is like the STATMEC mapping is not exactly an Ising model, uh, as in Adam's talk, so it's actually hard to keep track of. But in the limit, D goes to infinity, so D was my on-site Hilbert dimension, like my uh, on-site Hilbert space dimension. So if D is large, uh, there is kind of a large end limit if you want. Uh, there's a mapping of that transition onto percolation. And so that's something that I think I should have time to, uh, to explain a bit in the end. Okay, so those are all the results if I don't get through all of them. Um, let me now just actually start at telling you about how to uh, derive all of it. So, okay, so the, the rest of this lecture is gonna be trying to explain why this is true, um, building a lot on what Adam already told you about, um, and kind of maybe generalizing this. So <clears throat> what do we want to compute? Let me go back to this. So we want to compute this entanglement entropy or any entropy. And um, you know maybe I can copy paste this, uh, not necessarily, let, let's stare at it here. Right, so that looks pretty hard. Uh, we want to compute this, like, you know, we have all those partial traces uh, and we have a log and we want to average all those, this log, uh, you know, with the right bond probability of all circuits and measurement outcomes. Um, so uh, it, averaging logs is very hard. Uh, and, but in, you know, it's a problem that shows up in physics in many other fields, if you think of spin glasses or things like this. Um, and there's a, there's a standard solution, which is to use what's known as a replica trick. Uh, so Adam didn't need this in his lecture. So in the previous lecture, Adam was computing something like this, right? So if you remember, he was computing an average of a circuit of exponential minus S2. So notice that he, didn't compute average of S2, right? So those two averages in principle are different. You're averaging the exponential, you're averaging S2 itself. So this is the average of the purity, and this would be the average of the Renier entropy. Uh, without measurement, this is, it turns out this is a lot easier to average because it doesn't have this log. Okay. Uh, with those measurements, it turns out that in any case, you you need to you know you need to be careful because you have this denominator here as well. You have this bond probability. So in any case, you you know there, there's no simple way around this replica trick. Uh, but I should say the replica trick is also important for what Adam told you about. Okay, if you wanted to compute average of S two and not average of purity. So what is the replica trick? Well, it's based on a simple identity, which is rewriting this log as uh, uh, using this formula. Uh, so this is just an exact mathematical identity. So there's nothing super subtle here. Uh, but the basic idea is that averaging log X can be hard. Okay, so I'm gonna put a bar to say average, uh, but averaging a moment of X or so X to the K where K is an integer can be easy or a lot easier. Okay. And uh, the basic idea of the replica trick is you can say, imagine you compute average of xk where k is an integer. Uh, and then at the end of the calculation, you try to take k going to zero by some sort of analytic continuation. Okay. So if you use this formula in like the quantities uh, uh, in the Renier entropy, so you're going to find the following. So you have this limit, k goes to zero. You have like those averages over circuits, sum over m, the measurement outcomes, pm. Uh, you have this factor of k and this factor that comes from the Renier entropy. And now instead of averaging logs, you can check like just 
really applying this formula, uh, you can rewrite, and so far everything is exact, the formulas I had before as follows. So this is just an exact identity. The only thing I did uh, compared to like this formula here is again, I had a log of a ratio. I wrote this as log of the numerator minus of log of the denominator. And I used this formula above. Okay. Um, and so you notice I have this K here. Okay, so the important thing is that, yep, sorry. I have this K. Uh, uh, which is this uh, replica index. Okay, so and again, I apologize. I have many indices. So n is my Rényi entropy. K is this replica index. Uh, M are measurement outcomes. Uh, realize that's many integer, many uh, symbols and letters. Okay. Okay. And the basic claim, and again, like if you don't care so much about the technical details, this is really the only thing that will be important. Uh, is that averaging a quantity like that uh, is a lot easier. Uh, and so it's the same type of quantity that uh, Adam showed you how to average over hard gates. Uh, and here we'll have the no novelty will be the measurements. Okay, if n and k are integers. Okay. Uh, the important point is at the end of the day, we'll want k goes to zero. Um, so in order to make like a connection to a statistical mechanics model, I'm going to rewrite this in a um, suggestive way. So I'm going to keep the factor uh, k1 minus n here. I'm going to write, rewrite this as za minus z0. And the definition is kind of, uh, well, it's pretty much everything I haven't in included here. So for example, za will be just the first term in that sum. So that would be ZA, okay. Uh, would be the average of like trace of rho a to the n, everything to the k. And Z0 will be the same thing with the second term. Okay. So the, those are effective if you want partition functions and you'll see that those are the quantities that map to partition functions in a statmec model. Um, and this doesn't quite look like a free energy, like I told you before, but uh, actually you can rewrite this equivalently as follows. Uh, K okay, n minus one as a free energy difference where like those, where the free, free energy is defined as minus log Z in terms of those partition functions. Yes, I see this questions. Um, Okay, let me let me address the question right now. Yes. Okay. Good. So the yeah, I, I was already going to comment on this. So so the last term is uh, trace of row m to the n to the k. Since this last term is just a pure state, uh, you can rewrite this actually as you want. Uh, so this is the same as trace of uh, row m to the n k. Okay, and that's because rho m is just a pure state, right? There's no uh, rho m, there's no partial trace here, it's just psi m, psi m. <clears throat> okay, so let me explain the last step. It's maybe not clear to you why like difference of partition function is the same thing as difference of free energy. In general, it isn't. Uh, so why it's true here is because uh, the limit, so as k goes to zero, uh, those partition functions become trivial. So if you take this replica limit, uh, those partition functions become one. Uh, hopefully that's kind of clear from the definition. Uh, if k is zero, you see you're just averaging one and you're averaging one over measurements and over circuits. And so the average of one is always one. Huh? Okay, I think someone, is there a question or? Okay. okay, equivalently, let me just say that 
this trivial identity that I wrote before, you can put a log to it if you want. Uh, okay, uh, so that's what I'm using to write a free energy. Okay, so you can kind of already see where like this um, physics of, uh, okay, so I've, I've already written this as a free energy difference, right? So the, the caveat is uh, this limit, okay, one minus N. So this is like factors of a free energy difference. So F A minus F zero. So you see, we already wrote entanglement in terms of something I call the free energy difference. I have yet to actually show that's uh, like a free energy of a static model. So this is what's sketched on this slide. I have a bit more things that are already written down because there's like sketches that are a bit better if I don't do them in real time. Um, so you have this free energy, what I claim is a free energy difference. And that's what, you know, that's entanglement in that setup. Um, Okay, so there's a bunch of things I need to tell you, and I'll go in less details in some way than what Adam told you about. Uh, so Adam went into a lot of details with two replicas, and essentially everything that's on this, this slide was already in Adam's lecture. The only difference is we have more copies. Okay, uh, so let me go the steps one by one. So this will be kind of a reminder of what you already saw with Adam. Okay, so. <clears throat> What is the difference between A and zero? What's difference is the way we take the trace. Okay, so we have the same type of system, the same circuits, but we're taking the trace in a different way. And FA, we're doing this partial trace of the A bar first, and then we take the product N and then trace, and then we take everything to the K. And on the second term, actually it doesn't matter in which way you do it, you just have a pure state. You can imagine that you just like trace each replica with itself. So what you know difference between FA and F0 you'll, is that they'll have different type of uh, tensor contractions and again the same using the same language that Adam introduced before. So in Adam's talk, if you remember, you had two copies and we're saying that on the top boundary in region A, you had like this minus permutations and otherwise you had a plus permutation. Uh, so here is going to be kind of the same, except again, we have more copies. So let me start with kind of the easy thing. If you if you're in as if you're in uh, z zero or z naught or f zero, you what you have to do is you just want to trace at the end of the day, um, and so you imagine that you just have your states uh, and we're tracing it with itself, and we're doing this with with each replica. Okay, so this is kind of represented by this diagram. We have those. Uh, you know, we have those uh, circuits and, and we're gonna contract copy one with copy one star. So one star, one is the ket and the other one is the bra, right? So we have density matrices and we're just gonna, going to contract each copy with itself, okay? Uh, and again, Adam was doing the same except N was two for him. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Yes, uh, yeah. Can one think of this expression of entropy as some kind of derivative of the free energy. Yes, absolutely. So the divided by K is like a derivative. So if you prefer, uh, you, can, you can write this as a derivative here. Uh, those expressions are equivalent. Correct. So, so everything I'm telling you in terms of domain rule is true up to that subtle derivative that you have to take at the end of the day. Very good. Um, so in A, in FA, now you have to do something different in region A and in region A bar. Okay. Uh, so if you're in region, okay, maybe it's not a perfect notation. So FA is again like this first term here. So FA means like the StatMec model where like on the top layer, we will do this contraction in A bar. And in region A, we will do this uh, type of contraction. Okay. Um, so Again, I'm gonna just go back to uh, Adam's talk. So if you remember in Adam's talk, he had like uh, two copies, so one and one star, and then you had uh, two other, another replica, two and two star. Okay. Uh, 
And uh, you had different contraction, whether you're in A and A bar, right? So if you were in A, it was doing a contraction of this type. And if you were in A bar, you were doing a contraction of that type, right? Uh, so here, again, it's really the same, except we have like this N because we're doing N Rényi entropy. So doing the partial trace is like gluing one with one star with two, gluing two star with three, and so on and so forth. Uh, so instead of this minus state, this is something I'm going to call swap in region A, and in region A bar, which is gluing in each copy with itself. Okay. So again, I'm going relatively quickly on this just because Adam spent a lot of time on that tensor network contraction. So it's exactly the same meaning, meaning, uh, meaning where the contraction mean like a conic delta where you force indices to be the same. And we have a different pattern at the top uh, in A and A bar. Does that make sense? Okay, so <clears throat> really here I, I'm, uh, I'm relying on, on an atom stock. And if that step is not too clear, really the easiest way is to do it with two copies, uh, which is what Adam did in details. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you already see that you'll have some kind of different boundary conditions in ZA and Z0, right? So, and you kind of already see this picture of domain wall. It will be that in region A, we have a different boundary condition, uh, something different going on. So the other step, and I'm almost done, and I will, I will stop there and not go really too much into the details. Uh, the other step is averaging unitaries. And here again, that's something you did with Adam. Uh, you know, you, you had U, U star, U, U star. So you had two copies. And Adam wrote some formula on how you can average this. Um, and the averages give you those kind of Ising spins, right? That he called plus and minus it. Um, and after average, you only had those two states plus or minus that survived. So it turns out this can be generalized even if you have uh, Q copies, I should say with Q here. Um, so imagining that we have our system which is replicated and Q is the number of replicas. And that's the number of time the density matrix is occurring in those formulas. And so you see that density matrix is a little bit everywhere. So it's power N because we're doing Rényi. there's this power K and there's also this born probability. And so the number of times we have the density matrix is nk plus one. And the plus one is because of this born probability. So at the end of the day, we're like replicating the system. We're gonna average the unitaries block by block, one by one. Um, and we're doing a different type of contraction at the top, okay. So this is maybe now that we're approaching the end and I don't want to overwhelm you, overwhelm you with technical details, I'm maybe going to skip the last few, the very last few technical steps that I had. So I'm just going to say in words what you can do here. So again, in the same way that you can do the average over the two replicas like Adam did, you can do the same here when you have Q replicas. The only thing that survives instead of being Ising spins end up being permutations. Uh, so that's, so there's a formula like that, which is represented in terms of diagrams here. You can write it with indices and chronic deltas. Um, there are permutations of your replicas that survive and that tell you how to kind of contract the different legs. Okay. There are some coefficients. So they like the coefficient one over D or D squared minus one that Adam had everywhere in his formulas. Uh, in general, those are they're called Weingarten functions. The, the name doesn't matter. Uh, they are just some numbers that you can compute. Um, so after averaging, you have an, only a number of configuration that survives. Um, and so this is just a result of math, right? So with physicists, we're not just, it's not like we're all inventing how to average of unitaries. This was known before. Uh, actually, it goes back to a long time ago in some ways. Uh, it, at least the, you know, the, the deep meaning of, of this is no, something known as Schorweil duality, which is a very old result. Uh, about averages of unitaries, about like properties of unitaries. Um, so using the Haar average, you can show that this formula holds where you have permutations. And, you know, gluing the pieces of all the pieces of the puzzle together, you have the circuits replicated, different boundary conditions in A and A bar. Uh, now, instead of being Ising spins like Adam had, uh, they are like permutations. Each gate, replicated, we can average, and it gives us those permutations of the incoming and outgoing legs. 
but I am not explaining the meaning too much. Uh, again, same thing, like you had two different types of contractions that Adam had here, we have different permutations. And at the end of the day, once you contract your tensor network, if you want of your circuits, uh, it kind of decomposes onto blocks and we can compute each block. You can compute the weights of blocks one by one. And that's something I'm not gonna do. I'm just gonna go through the rest of the notes that I had here. I just had a couple of extra formulas. Um, you can compute the weights of all these blocks. And at the end of the day, it gives you a partition function. Okay, so, so I'll skip the precise weights. Those details don't matter too much. Uh, at the end of all this exercise, it's actually not as, you know, it may look quite technical and complicated if it's the first time you see this, um, but it's really, you know, not that involved in the sense that they kind of known formulas uh, from before. So it's, it's not like you have to reinvent the wheel if you know how to average over those unitaries. But at the very end of the day, you map your calculation of entanglements, which was extremely complicated in a non-equilibrium system where you have those measurements. It's a very nonlinear problem. You map it exactly onto effectively a free energy difference where you have a statmec model and you have weights and the degrees of freedom. Now, instead of being Ising spins, so that's maybe the only thing I will emphasize, uh, they end up being permutations of the replicas. So SQ is the symmetric group. Um, so, <clears throat> but you know, it's not an Ising model, but it might, it's in your head, it could be, right? It's essentially almost the same. If Q equals two, it's an Ising model. In general, it will just be permutations. And you have Boltzmann weights. And if you know how to compute the partition function or the free energy of those statistical mechanics models, you can compute the entanglement uh, or the Rényi entropy or the entanglement of Bondemann entropy if you want. Why is that useful? Well, it explains most of the phenomenology of those phase transitions. At least as far as I know, it actually explains all the possible phenomenology you can think of, you can reformulate in that statmec language. Um, you can think in terms of that domain world picture, you can get all sorts of scaling forms and so on, and they all work well numerically. You can think of the volume law phase as spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, of this, uh, of the symmetry of that statmec model which is related to this permutation group symmetry. So if you want, it's like replica symmetry breaking. Uh, it has a different meaning than in spin glasses, but it's like, you can think of this transition as a spontaneous symmetry breaking transition uh, in terms of that replica symmetry. One thing I should say is like, how come we haven't fully solved the problem with this? Well, the StatMec model is still a bit complicated. We don't really know how to solve it exactly. Uh, and really all the complication is here. Okay, so it gives you a lot of qualitative things, qualitative things, but taking that limit explicitly, uh, taking that replica limit is extremely hard in general. So that's why as of now, we don't have an exact solution of what that phase transition is. Uh, say if you, you know, you can do numerics, you can do many things, but there are a lot of, you know, we don't know how to get all critical exponents and do all calculations exactly um, uh, because of that replica limit here. There is one exception, and that's what I will just say to conclude. If you take, instead of qubit, if you take d degrees of freedom and you take d very large, then that statmec model ends up being very simple. Uh, and you can take that replica limit analytically. That's the last page of my notes that I won't go into, uh, where you map, you know, you can show that you end up with the mapping on percolation. Uh, but again, I've talked already enough, and I know it's been a long day. So I will just skip this. And if you're interested, you can have a look at the notes and uh, you can also send me questions by emails if you have questions about that part. And with this, I think I should just wrap up. And if you have more questions, I can take them in the last few minutes we have. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Roman. Okay. Other questions? Um, I, I have a about... question. Sorry. Oh, sorry, you can go. Um, it's about percolation. Mm -hmm. By percolation, you mean uh, which dimension you're dealing with in, in 2D or yeah. 1D so or 2D. 3D? Yeah, very good. It's, uh, so of course, it's the part I haven't really talked about. So by percolation, what I mean is like you get the StatMec model ends up being 2D classical bond percolation. And uh, you know maybe it should be relatively intuitive at least if you think about the problem, if you go back to the very, you know, to the physical setting, right? So you have this circuit, 
And you can think that whenever you make a measurement, you're effectively kind of breaking a link, right? You're kind of uh, cutting it if you want. Um, and so if you think of that minimal cut picture that Adam was talking about, uh, actually, if you apply the minimal cut picture to this to those circuits where you have measurements, you precisely get something like percolation. You can think that the measurements are kind of diluting your lattice. And effectively, it's a question of whether those uh, whether you still have kind of a percolating cluster despite the fact that you have dilution due to the measurements. And so it's a picture that you can make rigorous from the stat make mapping um, in that limit where D goes to infinity. I should say that in general, the transition is not percolation. So that bit we know, like for D goes to infinity, it's percolation, but in the lattice, like it's like for, you know, when people do numerics on qubits, uh, we know it's not percolation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I see there's a bunch of questions in the chat. So in the StatMec, in StatMec, calculating partition function gets harder as we increase system size. Does the replica method for random circuits also for suffer similarly or is there a way around? Yeah, no, so it's a good question. So it's, it's not because we mapped things to a 2D StatMec model that we're done. Uh, 2D StatMec models are still very hard to solve, okay? Um, so in some limits, when P is zero, you can do many things analytically, and that's what Adam was sketching. You can, uh, but in general, yes, we don't know how to solve those stat make models exactly. I should say though, like we still made a lot of progress compared to the original problem, because a 2D classical stat make model is still a lot easier than non-equilibrium quantum dynamics. Okay, you can simulate them in some cases. Maybe you can do Monte Carlo. You can uh, do transfer matrix approaches. You can write field theories. Uh, you can, you know. Like here, I'm thinking of a 2D classical StatMec model, but you can also write some effective Hamiltonian that correspond to that StatMec model. Uh, so there are various things that people did, like write down those effective Hamiltonians or write down like a field theory again for those Hamiltonians. Um, so we can still do a lot more with those StatMec models. But of course, you're right that in general, we cannot really do things analytically except in some special limits. Uh, so that's definitely one limitation of this approach. So, okay, then there's a question from Grace. Uh, I don't know if you want, oh, I guess I can read it, but uh, so in the directed random polymer, you can get some exponents without the replica limit since the replicated partition function is a generating function for the moments of the quench free energy. It's, does a similar thing happen here? So you can get exact exponents without taking K to zero. Um, not that we, that I know of. Um, I know what you mean. So here, no, so, so, you know, the. In the directed random polymer model, uh, uh, so uh, Grace is an expert, so like maybe, okay, so I should maybe explain for background for people like this domain world you can think of uh, as, as a polymer problem. And when you kind of deep in the volume law phase, there's a mapping onto once you have the measurements onto a directed polymer. And uh, there are interesting papers that came out recently and there's a pinning transition and there's some exponents that are known exactly here uh, on the dynamics of what this polymer does. Um, yeah, so, so in that case, you can get many of the properties and, you know, the, the stat make methods like that I sketched here have been used in, in those recent works as well uh, to kind of get properties of that polymer. So for the transition, unfortunately, no, uh, no. So we don't know what the critical exponents are of, of that entanglement transition, at least away from D equals infinity. And, uh, you probably need the replica limits, but I should say we just don't know, right? Like, but for D goes to infinity, we, again, we know how to write down the stat make model. We know all the critical exponents and we can take the replica limit analytically, but it's definitely crucial to take A goes to zero to get the right exponents. So I hope that answered your question, Grace. Um, okay. And Siren, so the last question I have on the chats, can we say that the university class is of Ising type with Z equals one and mapping to Ising model is possible because of the geometry of the circuit, linear light cone velocity. Um, so two things here. So the universality class is actually not Ising uh, because of that uh, replica limit and the fact that you have S cube. So the phase transition is actually Ising if Q equals two, uh, but when you take say Q equals three, or in principle, again, I should say Q, remember, is like this number of replicas. Uh, and at the end of the day, you wanna take K goes to zero, so the Q goes to one. 
Uh, so it's kind of a weird thing, right? We're taking spins and permutations, but at the end of the day, we want to take the limit with, you know, this permutations of one degree of freedom. So it looks trivial, but again, the limit isn't. Um, so the transition, the university class is not Ising. So it's one thing, even though I had Ising pictures, I, those were meant to be kind of like, to give some intuition. Unfortunately, it's not as simple and it goes beyond an Ising model. Um, whether we have z equals one and that's intuitive. Yeah, so z equals one really follows from the fact that uh, once you go to the StatMec model, yeah, there's, there's some anisotropy in, in the way the StatMec model is defined, but not enough to give you, you know, yeah, it's it, it's z equals one in the same sense that Ising model has z equals one as well uh, at criticality. Uh, so this follows relatively naturally from the StatMec model. Uh, I had one question yeah. right, at, right before the technicals uh, part, you mentioned that you have z equal to one and you have conformal invariance at the transition point. Yeah. Do you also have an idea what conformal field theory sits at that critical point or it can write effectively? Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> uh, so the answer in general is no. Um, so we know some things about that conformal field theory and over the years, many people uh, have worked very hard to get properties, at least numerically. Um, so uh, I've been involved in some of the works, uh, I guess like uh, the Rutgers group in particular, I guess Hayden is in the audience, uh, have worked quite a bit on this. And there's also many other groups that try to get really good exponents and you know good properties of like that conformal field theory. But indeed there is a CFT or conformal field theory describing the transition. When D goes to infinity, it is, a, Percolation, which is also a conformal field theory. Uh, but in general, we don't know what that conformal field theory is. And that remains one of the big questions in the field. Uh, among many others, right? I mentioned there's like, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of future direction, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of different phase transitions when you have different measurements, different symmetries, how to realize this experimentally, how to fight post-selection. Uh, there's really a pretty rich set of questions, but one of them is indeed like we still don't really know so much about that phase transition. I mean, we know qualitatively a lot. Uh, the volume law phase in itself is very interesting. I guess Grace was mentioning this directed random polymer uh, and people have realized, you know, because of this quantum emergent quantum error correcting code uh, that there's a lot that's in, going on in that phase as well. Uh, so anyway, there are many open questions. So if some, if some of you are interested in working on this, there's clearly a lot to do still. Okay, thank you.